that's just fooled me once. Shame. Fool me, we can't get fooled again. Welcome back in to Talking Catholic with David O'Gray. Hey, um, today we have to talk about a town hall webinar on social justice that they called Where is the Dignity of Black Lives? Take your knee off my neck, they called it. This webinar was organized by the Knights of Peter Claver and their Ladies Auxiliary, and it was held on September 12, 2020. For those who do not know, the Knights of Peter Claver were founded in 1909 by the Society of St. Joseph, the Josephites, with the noble mission to solve a problem that historically plagued black American men from becoming Catholics, that too many of them belonged to secret societies that were banned, such as the Freemasons. Similar to how the Knights of Columbus offered men a similar fraternal degree system with benefits, um, so too were the Knights of Peter Claver able to come along and offer the same opportunity for black men to find fraternity, but in a manner that was compatible with the Catholic Church. Yet, unfortunately, if you visit the Knights of Peter Claver's website today, it looks like just another political action committee of the NAACP. So too did their webinar on social justice, which among other guests also featured a man who was raised, said he was raised Catholic, but is now Baptist and is also Freemason. In the background, while he's talking, you can see the Shriners regalia proudly on display. And as he is, he proudly talking about all the things that he does with the Prince of Freemasons on social justice issues. Again, how far have the Knights of Peter Claver come from their intent of their foundation to now having an active bishop, His Excellency Ferdinand de Sherry, um, presiding over their webinar while this Freemason brags about how great the Masonic order is. Aside from that scandal, I thought it was very important to respond to the segment featuring EWTN's Gloria Purvis, in which she brought racism into the seamless garments and argued that abortion and racism are equal be because, or they're equally evil because both the life of the child in the womb and the life of the person experiencing racism are, both of their lives are sacred. Gloria's logic is flawed on a number of accounts that I will explain as we watch together some of her talk. Also, you should know that prior to this webinar, I publicly invited Gloria onto my podcast to flush out these issues together, but she declined, stating that there's, there's nothing to debate. I disagree. And let me begin with the first clip of her talk, into, and I'm not going to explain why. I will post a link to the entire webinar in the description box below, but... Um, in this first clip, Gloria grabs a, a hold of the traditional narrative given to black Americans that we should feel oppressed today by white people because some of those who look like us in the past experienced racism and oppression. She is speaking the same language as Al Sharpton and LeBron James to create a victim class of black people, regardless of the individual's own experience, that they should feel victimized, not because of any racism or oppression they have personally experienced, but because of all the bad things that have happened to some or many black Americans over the past 500 years. And I want to remind people that we should uh, be hopeful. And I believe we are as a people, as a black people, we are hopeful. We have been hopeful. We have not given up on our country. We certainly have never given up on God. And in fact, we know it is God who has been with us in our struggle. And even in our church, what we have faced lamentably, uh, racism, you know, exclusion, being told to wait in the back of the church. We have to wait till all the white people receive communion before we can, to be excluded from vocations to the priesthood and religious life. And then once you are in the priesthood or religious life, to still have to deal with the kind of uh, shameful, shameful, behavior from our brothers and sisters in Christ. Regardless of all of the awesome accomplishments and incredible stories that blacks in this country have to share, the narrative from the victim hustlers is that we as black Americans should only cling on to the tragedy and feel and embrace and own that tragedy that blacks have experienced at the hands of this objectified boogeyman called white people. In this next clip um, is where Gloria builds upon the consistency of life ethic to include racism. That racism is just as bad as abortion and just as pro-lifers should want laws to protect against abortion, they should also want laws to protect black people 
against racism. Now, as we fast forward and people consider, well, you know, I'm pro-life. I believe in the dignity of the human person from conception to natural death, from the womb to the tomb. Yet somehow in that calculus, people are unsure what to do in the area of racial justice. But to me, it seems so easy. For racial justice is born of the same ideology as the pro-life movement. They're one and the same. They share the same impetus, which is that each and every human person made in the image and likeness of God is worthy of dignity and respect. And somehow we have not been able to grasp that uh, this matters no matter what, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been born, no matter the amount of money you have, no matter what kind of a family situation you're in, it is the gospel truth. It is the truth that you are worthy of dignity and respect. And yet we don't know how, as if somehow these two issues, uh, wanting justice for people um, who are oppressed because of the color of their skin is not in conflict with wanting justice for the person in the womb or wanting justice for the person at the end of their life or wanting justice for the person who is disabled or wanting justice for those who are poor. These are all tied together back to Genesis 1:26, and that must be our rallying cry. That must always be the impetus for any justice movement. Joseph Cardinal Bernadine, who was the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Chicago, from 1982 to 1996 has three things that he'll always be remembered for. The first is creating a homosexual friendly climate in the parishes, rectories, and seminaries of the Archdiocese of Chicago. The second is like the first, Bernadine will always be remembered for the countless numbers of pedophile and epiphile priests he moved around from parish to parish. The third thing that he'll always be remembered for is his 1984 speech given in St. Louis where he brought nuclear war into what is called the consistency of life ethic, or the seamless garments, as it is properly known as. There in that speech, the Cardinal argued that abortion and nuclear war are both pieces of, of a larger pattern. The premise of his argument is that because all human life is sacred, there should be laws to protect human persons at every stage of development, and that all devices that solicit the premature death of the human person, such as abortion and capital punishment and assisted suicide and euthanasia, all those things um, should be abolished. On the surface, the consistency of life ethic sounds good. But in the political application of it, what it ends up meaning is two things. First, that you are not truly pro-life if your preeminent priority is for the child in the womb. And second, that when you vote, that it is okay to dismiss the candidate that does not have a preeminent priority for the life in the womb. If that candidate does um, uh, not view things such as capital punishment and poverty and disabilities, and now, according to Gloria Purvis, racism as equally evil as abortion. This is the same argument that 150 self-identified um, Catholic, social, Catholic social justice leaders recently signed on to in an open letter to Catholic voters saying that President Trump was not truly pro-life because he sends refugees to the um, and asylum seekers back home to face certain death and calls white supremacists very fine people and because he used the Bible as a political prop and a number of other false statements that, that these Catholic social justice leaders signed on to, thereby making them guilty of the grave sin of bearing false witness. They need to go to confession. I like the fact that Gloria wants to have this conversation about racism within the language of Catholic morality, within the delineated grounds of sin versus virtue. I like that. But she loses me with all her strawman arguments and undefined terms that only work if you're talking to a group of victims who don't need things explained to them. For example, when she says that people state that they are pro-life from womb to the tomb, but aren't sure about what to do with racial justice, she needs to explain why we need to segregate justice along the lines of race without creating a new problem. For if justice has, has to be adjudicated through the guidance of one's race, then how can that be just? Moreover, her argument here is dependent upon um, her narrative being true, that black people are still today in 2020 facing the same racism as black people in the past because of some systemic structures of racism that, that blacks are still unable to overcome. According to Gloria's argument, because of the, of the impunity of these systematic racist structures. The only way for there to be justice for blacks 
It's through cr the creation of special laws and social programs that intend to hand out to blacks a level of um, justice and standards that will make them equal with whites. If you think this sounds like glorious flirting with liberation theology, you would not be, uh, be mistaken in the least. Her argument that um, the vast majority of black people in this country are still being oppressed in the United States needs to be proven. And evidence of um, 235 blacks being killed by cops in um, 2019 isn't enough to prove that racism um, is, is evident today in the light of 370 white being killed. If we want to argue that blacks are killed disproportionately at a higher per capita rate than whites, then okay. Well then, but still, we have to deal with the fact that just about as many Hispanics are killed by the police on an annual basis. 158 to 235 in 2019 to be precise. And Hispanics are not even obliged to accept the, the victim narrative of, the, of them being killed by cops because their ancestors were enslaved, lynched, Jim Crow, not allowed to vote, and still haven't been allowed to have a Hispanic president. So this is an interesting conversation to have, baby. I wish Gloria would have accepted my invitation and come on to talking Catholic to have it. But she stated that there is nothing to debate here yet. Obviously, there is. If she's going to argue that there needs to be something called racial justice, she needs to explain why justice needs to be prefaced with the word race. And she needs to prove that blacks in 2020 are still being oppressed by these, this objectified group called white people. In this next clip, Gloria continues her straw man argument that apparently there are people out there who call themselves pro-lifers, but who are not wearing the seamless garments and therefore cannot understand that racism and abortion are the same thing, the, the same evil under different expressions or acts. Now, when I look at the pro-life movement, because I am pro-life, actively pro-life, and I look at the racial justice movement, I see the same desires, the same wants. We want legal protection for life. We don't want state-sanctioned killing. We don't want people in the womb, the unborn, with the aid of our government to be killed. We also don't want men and women in the street with the aid of our government to be killed extrajudicially. We think of Philando Castile, Sandra Bland, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and we should be rightfully outraged, saddened, and say we don't want this again. Just like pro-lifers would not settle with just even one abortion in this country. We too shouldn't settle for even one extrajudicial killing by the police. We should want justice for everyone. We should desire protection for everyone. Picking up where Bernadine left off, Gloria here is arguing that people in the womb and people who are being oppressed due to the color of their skin are equally deserving of justice, but that pro-lifers fail to grasp that they should see the child in the womb the same as they see the person who is being oppressed. Perfectly arguing the dark doctrine in the seamless garment, Gloria states that um, life in the womb, the life of those at the end of their life, the life of the disabled, the life of those who are poor, and are all tied together and should be the impetus of any social justice movement. But that we do not include them all together as such because we ha have not had an inner conversion of heart, she says. She mentions the name of Philando Castile, a black man who was unharmed, you know, proving her argument. She mentions Philando Castile, a black man who was um, shot um, when he was unarmed by a Hispanic police officer at a uh, travel stop. Sandra Bland, a black woman who was found hanged in a jail cell in Texas. Brianna Taylor, a black woman who was shot when police officers responded to gunfire after they entered her home, and George Floyd, a black man who was slowly killed by asphyxiation after resisting arrest. She mentioned these names without proving that any of them died from racism. And the, um, as tragic as their deaths are, to be sure, all of which could have been avoided with more responsible police uh, conduct and or people not resisting arrest, but none due to racism that anyone has proven. Yet, the fatal argument and glorious argument here is that the church has always taught that the life in the womb, the child in the womb, has our preeminent priority over all other stages of human development because it is in the womb where life begins. If we do not protect life there, we cannot protect it later. 
Inasmuch as all life is sacred, life in the womb has our preeminent priority because life in the womb is the most defenseless of all life. It is the most vulnerable of all life. It is the most dependent of all life. It is the most voiceless of all life. And it is the only life that can be legally killed. Consider this. There is a reasonable expectation that if a person outside the womb is unjustly killed by a civilian or by a police officer, that in 2020, that perpetrator will be caught and persecuted. The only exception to this reasonable expectation is that if you're a black hurt person killed by a black person in the cities like Chicago, St. Louis, Detroit, and Baltimore, in those cities, the killer or killers are rarely found or persecuted, yet even worse in those cities, even worse in those dire situations, the life in a womb does not have any reasonable expectation that if it is killed by its mother or their abortion henchmen, without any um, ad, um, adjudication or due process, a child in the womb can be slaughtered for any reason whatsoever. Therefore, yes, all life is sacred. But as the church has always taught, the life in a womb is our preeminent priority. Our first duty is to defend the life in the same place where Christ began his life on earth. In fact, Mary and Joseph had more of a duty to parent and protect as parents to protect Jesus' life in the womb than they did when he was on the cross. Because in the womb, Jesus was more vulnerable, more dependent, more defenseless. And completely voiceless. Certainly, Jesus identifies with, with us at every stage of human development and each human condition he identifies with us and he asks us to see each, him um, in each other. But it's in, in the, the life in the womb where he calls us to see him and touch him and, and hear him, where he, can, he cannot be seen, heard, and touched. The child in the womb is our preeminent priority, our higher calling to be abolitionists. Because if we understand that it is there where the sacredness of human life begins, then we will, we will be able to get the, the sacredness of human life correct at later stages. This is the basic logic of first principles. It is, it is why life in the womb has our preeminent priority. Lastly, Gloria shows us the combination of what she calls racial justice, the issuance of justice along the divisions of race by making a pitch for Black Lives Matter. And of course, we know that Black Lives Matter. Why? Because we're made in the image and likeness of God. We know that rallying cry for this racial justice movement is not in contradiction to what we believe as Catholics. Now, there may be some people that cannot understand this gospel truth because there are few people they believe who are involved in this movement that have contrary motives. But we have to also know that those people don't represent the entire movement, nor should, quote, those people stop us from doing the gospel work of trying to uh, make our society more just for all of us. I've already made a number of videos explaining how stupid the organization and the mantra Black Lives Matter is. So I'll just say this succinctly here that, that Gloria is arguing for Black Lives Matter. Her argument is a deep grasp, the sink low, to cling lay hold of a worldly and flawed language to explain a divine truth about why all life is sacred. For Catholics, we do not prove that all life is sacred by pointing to a slogan called Black Lives Matter, a slogan that was made up by a communistic organization of that same name. Rather, for Catholics, we prove that all life is sacred by pointing to the cross of Calvary. It is not to a sign emboldened with the phrase Black Lives Matter that Catholics point to rally the faithful to action. Rather, it is to the phrase in hoc signo vinces that we point. We Catholics have a 2,000 year old language and theology that speak about the sanctity and dignity of all human life. Just as Jesus spoke only the words his father given, given to him, just as we use the language of the church in our liturgy rather than our own words, so too are we called to speak in a universal language of the church to call things what they are. And the phrase Black Lives Matter is beneath our tongue. To the cross and to the sign of the cross is where we point. Not to man in his Marxist mantras. So again, I, I, I like the fact that Gloria wants to talk about racism within the language of sin. But overall, her argument just comes off as, as a liberal politician's stump speech read off a teleprompter. It comes off as a lecture you might expect to hear in the hall of any American liberal university or, or talking points taken off the Black Lives Matter website. If you disagree, Gloria, you're always invited to come on and prove me wrong. But until then, and until next time, blessings and shalom to you and to yours.
fool me, we can't get fooled again. 